and um, we, we had a, an amazing week in, in Strasbourg and it's amazing to be to be here. Um, my name is Shane Clark, I'm the CEO of Nano Lego Place, Cork, Ireland as mentioned, and I'm here with my uh, marvellous uh, colleagues. Um, Nano Lego Place is, as I hope will become evident in the presentation, essentially an urban village, and as such, it's only appropriate that I share the building here with my brilliant colleague, uh, Dr. Danielle O'Donovan, who will do much of the heavy lifting and indeed basically wrote what, uh, what is before us here today. Uh, and our plan is to, tra uh, to trace a narrative from the 18th century in Cork to the 21st century, from the local to the global, and it's to show how Nano Nagel's radical uh, vision of education and social justice is made real in today's world. We want to show uh, how religious uh, built heritage can be regenerated to community purpose and to celebrate living heritage and a continuity of community. Um, last week, our team, including the Presentation Sisters, uh, which Nana Lego founded, and the uh, Lord uh, Mayor of Cork City, travelled to Strasbourg uh, to receive the Council of Europe Museum Prize 2022. The prize exemplifies museums that have contributed to human rights and democratic citizenship. And my colleague Danielle will take the story all the way back to the 18th century. Uh, so if you saw me uh, at breakfast with PowerPoint, that was me working between 12 and 6 to get the PowerPoint working. So I want you all to hold your breath and make sure we get there. So, at Nano Nagel Place, we use the story of a valiant woman and the many remarkable women who followed her in her footsteps to inspire people to change the world in the present. Um, Nano Nagel was born into a wealthy Catholic family in 1718, and thanks to that wealth, she could have chosen to do nothing. But instead, she chose to uh, move to the south parish of Cork City an area where a contemporary a commentator described the doorways as thronged with poor children. She proceeded to establish seven schools, five for girls, her focus was girls, and two for boys. She taught the children how to read, how to work, and how to pray, three skills that she knew would allow them to empower themselves. In the evenings, she went out into the laneways and the garrets of Cork City to visit the poor and the sick, carrying her lantern to light the way. Essentially, she set up our education and outreach department in circa 1754, which I do understand is an unfair advantage. Nano addressed urgent local issues and said that if she could be of service anywhere in the world, she would gladly do all in her power, suggesting that she had a global vision too. And that is the heritage of Nano Nagel Place. The most re uh, remarkable thing um, is that her schools were secret. They were run in secret. And um, they were con as they were contravened by the penal laws, which withdrew many rights from anyone who did not conform <coughs> to the established religion, including the vast majority of the population who were Roman Catholic. So Nano made <coughs> a point of breaking those laws on a very regular basis. Not only did she uh, operate seven schools, catering for hundreds of children. She invited the Ursuline sisters to come from Paris to Cork to help her and establish an illegal convent for them. Nano is not yet recognized as a feminist icon, but she was fearless and she was radical, um, ignoring the instructions of the local bishop and priest when they tried to get her to change her plans. Um, in 1775, Nano founded her own religious congregation, the Presentation Sisters, who were unbound by the rule of enclosure, meaning that they could leave the convent uh, to educate the poor and to care for the sick. The Presentation Sisters spread across Ireland and then across the world, and they can now be found across five continents. And could you just note this lovely young, uh, fresh-faced lady with no veil on in her postulant's dress? You're gonna meet her again. So, Nana Nagel Place houses the Presentation Sisters Congregational Archive, a vast collection of documents spanning 300 years. The archives contain account books and they contain annals, a kind of a narrative of the convent, um, rule books and school rule books, and many other kind of administrative documents. And they give the details of the kind of stuff of life, but what they don't give is that kind of 
history of what it was like, the lived experience of what it was like to be a nun and live in a convent and teach poor children. So the rule of poverty means that we do not hold a vast and rich collection. Religious sisters don't um, keep personal items and even items associated with convent life tend to be heavily worn, um, like this prayer timer you see here. Um, <clears throat> and often things are non-existent because they've been used until they've worn out. Um, and it's really important that we gather what's left of those kind of convent remains and also the memories of the sisters who lived that convent life. So an example of that, um, of, of these kind of issues of kind of intangible heritage, the sisters lived experience, and the loss of collections um, was exemplified this summer when we wanted to um, hold an exhibition about 250 years of convent life. So we said, Sister Rosari, archivist, get out the habits and we'll have a look and see what we have. And we suddenly realized we didn't have a full habit, we didn't have all of the veil pieces. We had one gam, which is that white thing, one bandau, and none of the veils. So we had to troop down to the convent and ask Sister Mary uh, on the left and Sister Patricia, who's that young faced postulant you saw a minute ago on the right, how everything went together. And they sat there for ages going, How did you get it on? <laughs> But there were definitely flaps here that held the white thing on. And it was just, I mean, it felt like experimental archaeology. And then they revealed to us that the whole veil was pinned together. And that actually, instead of taking it on and off every day, they used to just take it off like a motorbike helmet and hang it on a boomstick. <laughs> so um, you can see how we're actually in a race against time to capture all of those aspects of convent life that are held with these you know, very elderly but very charming women. We couldn't have made those habits without them. And you know, the sisters are fascinating because when they um, commissioned the museum, they actually didn't want to put habits into the museum. They didn't really want to talk about themselves. Nuns don't really talk about themselves. They said, we want to tell the story of Nano. She's our founders, she's our ethos. And we want to tell the story of our work, our work in Cork and our work around the world. Um, but you, you will know that people like to hear personal stories. So people do enjoy the story of Nano Needle. I've done the tour so many times and there's all these bits where you can feel people just leaning in. You know, they're like, what? She didn't tell her family. She actually founded all these secret schools and they were really cross with her. And so, you know, she's a great figure. And I actually remember doing the tour once for a young woman. And she said, how old was Nana Nagel when she, um, when she founded her first school? And I said, well, I think she was about 30. And the woman said, well, I've still got time. And I thought, oh my God, this is actually working. <laughs> how amazing. Um, but yeah, we do have people who want to hear about life in the convent and joining the convent. And <clears throat> tucked away in the sacristy of our museum is this video. And it shows a very young-faced Grace Redmond joining the Presentation Sisters in Wexford in 1966. And um, it's just such an intimate portrait of this experience of her going into the convent. And they had by that time accepted enclosure, so she wasn't going to come out again. And even in the narrative of the video, you hear her mother's crack, her mother's voice crack when she says, today's a very special day for us because Gracie's going in to be a nun in the presentation convent. <laughs> and you can hear the emotion in her voice. Grace herself, who is on our board and who I've watched the video with said, I was excited, you know, I didn't think anybody was going to be sad because I was doing what I wanted to do. And if it didn't go well, she could only leave. But she said, uh, when we were watching the video, that she'd never seen her dad cry before. And there's a part in the video where her dad does break down into tears. And you know, one of the things that happens, everybody who goes around the museum basically storms out and says, what happened to Grace Redmond? And of course we can tell them, well, she's on our board. <laughs> <laughs> right, Shane, you're on. Right, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Um, well, if you cut to 2006, uh, it was a very changed world. Uh, there was once three schools, and I think possibly around 1900, maybe a thousand students. It was a very, very busy place, and the convent had up to 30 sisters at one stage. And that had all changed. The, the schools had flown out to the suburb, you know, the inner city of which Cork is, uh, of which the uh, uh, South Present was originally called, was in decline. Uh, and the convent was now down to three, essentially little old ladies rambling around. A very, um, a very significant holding in the city. 
This is where it is in Cork. So that's Cork City, it's on an island, uh, medium sized city, and we're in the south parish to the south there, about three and a half acres on that side. So a significant holding, a wall convent, so it wouldn't have been possible for outsiders to get inside. So actually many of the locals wouldn't have known uh, what was behind those uh, closed walls. Um, here is a, another picture before the redevelopment. Uh, I mean, it is a village in the city, it is an enclave, it is a world uh, in and of itself. And, and now when people come in, the serenity of this place within the city is, uh, is really rather astounding. Uh, the site uh, is an accumulation of architecture, Georgian from 1771, where Nano built a, a convent for the Ursuline uh, sisters from, um, from, uh, from France. So the tranquil graveyard, actually we've got two graveyards on the site, a series of 18, very lovely 18th century uh, buildings that were built in sequence, 19th century Goldie, uh, Goldie Chapel, and early 20th century school. But as I said, this was in a state of dereliction. This was in a state of ruin. It looked very sad and sorry. The sisters began to dream big. Um, and there was a process of getting to the start of Nano Lego Place and the start of what we are as a charity and a business. Uh, and the sisters were very experimental. They're very hands-on, they're entrepreneurial. This is a project called We Made This, uh, which went out and looked at what the need was locally and asked people locally, what do you need? And brought them together and it was a sort of co-creation of uh, community regeneration. This We Made, pro uh, we Made This project then turned into the Lantern Project, which is one of our, uh, one of our core community projects. Um, the, the lady on the left is one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. This is Sister uh, uh, Sister Joe McCarthy, who's essentially an anarchist, as far as I can I can make out. Uh, she doesn't abide by any of the rules of the religious uh, the religious order. She does her own thing, which actually is the spirit of Nano Nagel uh, in the 21st century. So Sister Joe established the Cork Migrant Centre. Uh, she spent an awful long time in, in South America, and I think in the Philippines. And the Cork Migrant Centre's raison d'etre really is to reach out and welcome those new arrivals to Ireland. Started with the Filipino community, uh, the Polish community. More recently, uh, we have something in Ireland called the Direct Provision Service, where, whereby refugees are housed in really terrible, dispiriting and depressing circumstances, essentially boxed into, into open prisons. And uh, we do a huge amount of work, our sister Joe and her colleagues, Dr. Naomi Machetti does that. And more recently, as was noted earlier, the Ukrainian community uh, is arriving on our doorstep. And Sister Joe and uh, Dr. Naomi Machetti are reaching out to that community and making them feel welcome. Um, so, cut forward, significant investment, beautiful regeneration. Um, so some of the older pictures, changing to, before and after. This is the convent, now repurposes community rooms. And this is a nice picture here. On, on the right hand side is our men's group, one of our three core groups. Uh, and this is the old uh, parlor, and now the men's group, a men's shed, that might be a, an expression known to people in Ireland and England. So very, very vulnerable, often lonely, isolated men uh, with social problems, uh, addiction problems, and bring those men together. Probably our most challenging group, actually. Uh, and that's actually bringing you know, those men back into the core of what we're doing. Um, I'll just let this play and then hand over to Danielle. <laughs> this gives you some idea of the scale of the site. Yeah, and just to say, um, yeah, I was just checking with Steve on that, who, who looks after our uh, rooms and events. I'm the English classes, the free English classes for Ukrainian people start in a few hours. So uh, the work continues. So, now a naval place is a, a calm and a tranquil space, um, and in its regenerated state, it's become a real sanctuary um, for museum visitors and for the community education participants. Um, Cork Migrant Centre, the Lantern and the Men's Group moved back on into this rege regenerated site in uh, 2018, um, and we all became neighbours because the, the museum had opened in halfway through 2017. Um, Shane has already mentioned this direct provision, and at the moment, the main focus of Cork Migrant Centre is working with those people and really making our naval place a sanctuary. So essentially what direct provision is, is housing families in hotels, and they have one hotel room each. The whole family live in one room. They have no cooking facilities, and they have to eat meals at set meal times. So you can imagine how absolutely disruptive that is to family life. And women are often, they've got young children, they're trapped in these direct provision centres. And so Naomi and her team really work to bring those women 
internal legal place to look after the babies because they're living in weird like horrible hotel environments there's no early years um um kind of provision for the little kids the little children so they get looked after by students from university college called early years department and the women do capacity building um, activities naomi calls this healing through crafts and she says that nanonagal place or cop migrant center for these women is a psychosocial well-being center she's looking out for what their needs are and she's trying to help them and empower them to kind of settle in to our society and actually um, these women have recently formed a cooperative which just won the Colt Business Award. Oh, sorry. Uh, these are, here they are. So this is them doing printmaking. Sometimes the children join in the activities as well. Um, so they've actually just won, I think, was it the Colt Business, Business Awards kind of innovative business of the year. So they're so proud. So they're off now and making their own money, having kind of been empowered through the service. Um, we do look after toddlers too, but another really important group is the teenagers. Because if you can imagine that you're living in a hotel room with your mum and dad, how do you even do your homework? How do you kind of, you, often these direct provision centres are in the middle of nowhere, so they have to use kind of a bus transport service a few times a week to get to different places. So at Nanonagal Place they come, there's a homework club, and they get to do uh, loads of different creative activities, and hip hop is very important to them. So the CMC Youth Initiative, the Ubuntu hip hop group, are amazing. And you can see um, a picture later of when they actually managed to get our Prime Minister to do a TikTok dance. They're <laughs> absolutely <laughs> amazing. Um, oh, what have I gone backwards? So just to say, you know, um, you know when you read lots of museum theory and you talk about museums and how everyone works in a silo and nobody works with each other. And I have to admit to you that when CMC and the Lantern came and came back to Nanonagal Place, they had their vision. We had to run the museum and we didn't work together very much. And actually, interestingly, they didn't work together very much. They had two meetings together. But the lantern came Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the migrants came kind of Thursday and Friday. So everybody missed each other. We were like ships that passed in the night. Um, and we decided we had to do something about that. So if we're a real museum, the collections are relevant to our outreach. I wish I had the beautiful video that broke this whole PowerPoint <laughs> to show you. Of, sh of working on a project called Diversity Academy, which is completely stolen from Tanya Bergera's School of Inclusion, and I completely admit that a good idea doesn't care who had it. I love that phrase. Um, and essentially, this brought the migrants and the lantern together, uh, participants, to work on a, a combined craft project based on our collections. So I said to you that Nan and Abel taught people how to work, and she taught girls how to sew. And in the collection, we have these incredible embroidery samplers that girls would have made. And it's like a CV in stitches, essentially. And it was the, the thing that you could take out to get you a job. So look at all these sewing stitches that I can do. So the, the, they looked at those. Our, our um, archivist taught them through the history of the samplers. And they were inspired by that to go and make their own project. And they all made a piece of embroidery on the theme of home. This was a beautiful project with the artist Anne Metrelink in the centre. She cried after every session. <laughs> it was really moving. Um, and they demanded a trip to the seaside and for the next project to start very soon. So I consider that to be a success. <laughs> um, so kids, COVID came and hit us all like a freight train. And as Shane's already said, some incredibly vulnerable people engage with the services and an enable place. So the Lantern, who look after um, isolated older people, were sending 2,000 texts a week to all of their participants. And Karina was basically channeling herself, Karina, the director of the Lantern, was channeling herself on Facebook, just sending hopeful and positive messages. And that seemed to really get people through. Um, uh, Co-op Migrant Centre went one step further. Nano Naval would have been so proud of them, they totally broke the lockdown. They um, decided that anybody living in direct provision was just not safe because they all live crammed in together. How can you socially distance in a hotel when you all sleep in one bedroom and share a hotel with so many families? So uh, there was some of the women in direct provision were seriously good seamstresses. They started sewing face masks before face masks became mandatory. And by breaking lockdown rules, beg, bar by begging and borrowing um, sewing machines, they managed to deliver three reusable face masks to everybody in direct provision in County Cork, and I can't remember how many people that is. Whoops, I keep forgetting to do the slides. Back. Does this go back? No, go back. There they are. There they are sewing in the garden. So um, it was a seri serious piece of work, but it was so impressive. Um, another group who were particularly vulnerable were the men's group. Um, 
they started going out for walks in the park together. Again, lots of text messages going around. And as soon as it was possible to get them back in to the site, um, they came back in. And not everybody made it through the lockdown from that group, which was really tragic. But it shows you just how vulnerable they really are. <clears throat> now, as you all remember, during the lockdown, um, George Floyd was killed. And that had a huge <coughs> impact on the CMC Youth Initiative. And they decided to call a meeting with the Lord Mayor of Cork City and um, people from the Department of Education to highlight instances of when they'd experienced racism in Ireland. And they wanted to um, also make a creative output to, to kind of express their pain and how they were feeling. So Shane gave them the front windows of Narrow Labour Place. Uh, we had an artist whose name I can't remember. Kate O'Shea. Kate O'Shea. Kate O'Shea, <laughs> who came and worked with them. And they made this amazing artwork that ran right across the windows. And again, you kind of say, well, does this relate to the collection? Well, over on the right hand side, you can just see deeds, not words. That's Nano Nagel's family motto. So they were very proud of this artwork. And obviously, they had to have a serious dance uh, to, uh, to celebrate its, um, its launch. So we are a community embedded museum, but at the heart of our site, we have a religious community. So it's a sacred space and a place where religious sisters still live and where Nano Nagel, who is on her way to beatification, is buried. Um, as a really secular staff, uh, we have a delicate job to do in making the space of and with the community while also being respectful of the sisters and their ethos and spirituality. Uh, we want to be really approachable and to give all suggestions due consideration and to say yes to as many of them as possible. So it's just that balancing act, you know, because it is a sacred space. So a, a man got in contact recently, he wanted to run a play uh, in, in a chapel. And I read the content of the play and then said, I don't think this works for an ex-convent. And he said, oh, no, you're absolutely right. You know, it still is a, a convent. Um, so we've done things like had Chinese New Year. And as museum professionals, this could freak you out. It was a thousand live candles. They couldn't be electronic and they couldn't be blown out. So we had to wait until they went out before they could go home. And we left our youngest member, me member of the facilities team who promised us he hadn't blown them out, but I'm not sure. It was a very <laughs> long evening. We had a Chinese dragon. It was just a great event. And you know those kind of events where it's just like, this is what it's all about. Um, we are the, the home of East Falk Early Music Festival. Oh, what? I keep forgetting to do the slide. Sorry, everyone. And, um, they're a very lively bunch. We have great kind of concerts with them. The acoustic in our chapel is really beautiful, but they also run our children's outreach for us. And another of the videos was showing uh, children dressed up in 18th century costumes doing some 18th century dancing. Uh, this was a good one. We hosted the Guinness, uh, Guinness Cork Jazz Festival. This was edgy because we do have a coffin on our site that is where Nana was buried and you can see it. And this performance did also include coughing because it was a New Eileen style jazz funeral called Requiem for Truth. And I know that some sisters were a bit upset, but one of them volunteered to do the eulogy, so they weren't all upset. <laughs> <laughs> and that culminated in a procession uh, through the site, uh, which was absolutely amazing. The coffin came down the steps, and we had another little um, jazz session on the front plaza. And you know, it, it is a tricky thing, and, and I guess all of you guys will know it. If you're a community museum, you kind of feel like you have to say yes to the community. But it's a balancing act because, as I was saying to our team earlier, what do you do when the choir who can't sing want to come and sing? Um, you have, you know, they said, we love you. We love here. This is why we want to sing. And you say, great. <laughs> it's just really clever programming to work out where community events sit uh, so that we don't compromise kind of more kind of better performances I'm going to thank you amongst friends um, by you know people like East Falk Early Music Festival and with that I'm going to hand over to Shane <laughs> I'm going to try uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Um, my, my instruction to Danielle is to say no to everybody, and she does absolutely the opposite and says yes to everybody. Uh, but it is it is the joy of Nano Lego Place. It means we all work seven days a week, uh, and it is a community of. As part of that, we, we aim to be, as I said, we're an enclave. We sort of joke maybe we're like an Italian hilltop village in the city 
Uh, the site is, as I said, spread over three and a half acres, and it's a very hilly site. The sort of the the, the elevations probably move about five floors from one side to the other, so you get these marvelous views uh, across the city. Um, so, let me just go to the next one. Um, so Cork is a UNESCO uh, city of learning. It's a World Heritage uh, Organization healthy city. It's a city of sanctuary. Uh, it's recently been announced as one of the European Commission's 100 climate neutral cities. And we aim to sort of exemplify all those values. You know, to be all things good in Cork in one uh, significant uh, place. Um, and I'll, I'll, finish on, I'll finish on this lovely image. Um, for those that don't know, uh, the gentleman uh, in the middle is our Taoiseach, our Premier, our Prime Minister. And this, was, uh, this photograph was taken on Saturday Gone, uh, when the Taoiseach very kindly came and visited us in recognition of the uh, Council of Europe Museum Prize Award. Um, and we had all the different uh, parts of Nana Lego Place there, including the young people from uh, the Cork Migrant Centre. And there is a TikTok video uh, which their PR were extraordinarily nervous about, but we managed to get <laughs> we managed to get this uh, we managed to get this image here. Ireland is a, a young country; it's a young republic. We're 100 years old, and actually, I think the distance travelled from 1922 to 2022 is, I would hope, exemplified by this image here. You know, the, the future is migration. The future is those things that I've talked about, and uh, you know, our recognition by the Council of Europe in terms of those democratic values, in terms of those bridging communities. In terms of you know uh, a, a secular staff actually paying due homage to that continuative community, to that living heritage, uh, that's what we want to exemplify. We don't always get it right, but I think we're entrepreneurial, uh, we're creative, or certainly my colleagues are in a way that Nana was, and we bring that 18th century story alive and into the 21st century. So it's, look, it's a huge honour on behalf of myself, my colleague uh, Danielle, my other colleagues Sosha and Susanna here, the board and the sisters. It's an enormous honour to receive the award and to stand before you here today. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to this one.